You might remember a few weeks ago, I made one of those ever so slightly apocalyptic videos that I like to pop out every now and then. It was based on the second of three reports that make up IPCC AR6, otherwise known as the sixth assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The first two reports were pretty grim, I must admit. They told us that climate change is already killing human beings, destroying nature, and making the world a poorer place, not just economically, but environmentally as well. And that if we stayed on our current consumption and greenhouse gas emissions trajectory, then many parts of the planet would be pretty much uninhabitable by the end of this century. So, you know, not ideal. But of course, just pointing out the problems is only half the job. You also need to bring a few solutions to the table as well. And that's essentially what the third and final section of the sixth assessment report, which was published last week, attempts to do. So let's see what they've come up with, shall we? Hello, and welcome to Just Have a Think. The IPCC has been publishing comprehensive assessments of the most up-to-date climate research every five or six years or so since 1990. But this third part of their sixth assessment is actually the first time they've provided an in-depth analysis of how the behaviours, choices and consumption of us humans could, and I have to stress the word could, contribute to limiting global warming to that all-important 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, above which the scientists tell us many of the catastrophic consequences of climate change would become irreversible. Emissions of all the gases that warm our atmosphere have been on a very significant upward trajectory since 1990. It's not just carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels and changes in land use like deforestation. It's the fluorinated gases that we use in things like refrigerators and air conditioners, the nitrous oxide that comes predominantly from the fertilisers used in agriculture, and it's the methane emissions from the belches of 2 billion cattle and other ruminant animals, from leaks in natural gas pipelines and processing plants, and from the rapidly melting permafrost up in the Arctic, where temperatures are rising two to three times faster than the global average. Those increases obviously vary from region to region, as this chart shows. If you just take your numbers from 1990, then it's clearly Eastern Asia, and predominantly China, that's been driving much of the increase in greenhouse gas emissions. But this second chart, showing cumulative emissions since 1850, reveals that North America and Europe are responsible for almost 40% of all historical emissions. So while the temptation to point the finger and blame others may be very high, especially in our current geopolitical situation, it's probably not a particularly fair or particularly helpful thing to do. The critical question is what does the future hold and what do we need to do now? The IPCC makes it very clear that if we follow the current set of global climate mitigation policies, then our kids and grandkids will see an average global surface temperature increase of about three degrees above pre-industrial levels. That would mean more than a million species of animals and plants going extinct on land and in our oceans towards the end of the century, and more than a billion human climate refugees attempting to migrate from uninhabitable areas to somewhere they can actually survive which may well lead to regional and international conflicts as 10 or 11 billion human beings all fight over a rapidly decreasing amount of livable space and an increasingly limited supply of edible food and drinkable water. To give ourselves a greater than 50% chance of avoiding that nightmare and limiting warming to the safe level of just 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, then global greenhouse gas emissions, or GHGs, will have to reach their peak no later than 2025, say the IPCC. So that's less than three years from now. And the International Energy Agency just told us that global CO2 emissions went up by another 6% in 2021, as we all bounced back from COVID. So our trend line's not looking too encouraging right now. By 2030, less than eight years from now, the world needs to achieve a 48% decrease in carbon dioxide emissions compared to 2019 levels to stay on target for 1.5 degrees of warming. By 2040, we're looking at an 80% decrease in CO2 to stay on the 1.5 degrees pathway, by which time we'll also need to have reduced methane emissions by 44% compared to 2019 levels. Is this looking challenging to you? Because it is to me. The slightly better news, according to the IPCC, is that there's a range of tangible actions we can take to stop the runaway freight train. They set out all these so-called mitigation options in a single chart focused on what can actually be achieved by or before 2030. As well as the ability to be rapidly implemented this decade, 
The two other criteria that the IPCC apply are number one, how big an impact will it have on the problem? And number two, how much will it cost? So these numbers across the top represent how many billions of tonnes of CO2 equivalent emissions could be avoided by the deployment of each method. And these colours down here represent the cost of implementing each option. Blue bar costs are lower than the reference, which effectively means they're likely to be cheaper than the current solution, which is a good thing. We're definitely looking for some blue bars here. A yellow bar means it'll cost between zero and 20 US dollars per tonne of CO2 equivalent emissions avoided. And it goes right up to the dark red bar, representing a cost of between 100 and 200 dollars per tonne. The most immediate and obvious step will be to phase out the burning of coal, oil and natural gas as soon as possible. That means no more new coal mines, no more new fracking facilities and no more new oil exploration. At the same time, we need to be transitioning very rapidly to what the IPCC call low emission energy sources. The clear winners here are wind and solar energy. Their costs have dropped off a cliff in the last decade and in most parts of the world, they're already competitive with or cheaper than fossil fuels. So according to this chart, we can get well over 2 billion tonnes of CO2 emissions reductions every year with wind and solar, with a net lifetime cost saving compared to existing fossil fuels. Large scale wind or solar farms can be implemented in months, not years, so they're definitely a rapid option as well. But of course they'll need the mass implementation of many of the innovations we've looked at on this channel in previous videos, like energy storage, interconnected smart grids, demand side management and integrated systems. None of the other forms of low emissions energy come anywhere close either on cost or on the amount of CO2 emissions they can avoid by 2030. In some cases, that may be because of geographical limitations like with hydropower and to a certain extent geothermal energy. And in the case of nuclear energy, high upfront costs and lengthy construction times plus the longer term costs of storing radioactive waste mean it doesn't look like a good option on the 2030 timeline. Just below nuclear power we've got carbon capture and storage or CCS which no doubt many of you have heard about and which we've talked about before on this channel. Essentially it's the idea that power plants and industry could continue with business as usual processing and burning fossil fuels but with extra machinery added to their exhaust stacks to capture the carbon dioxide which would then in theory be stored permanently underground. The trouble is these technologies are not at all widespread. According to the Global CCS Institute, there are only 27 facilities currently operating anywhere in the world today. They removed about 70 million tonnes of CO2 in 2020. Set that number against the more than 40,000 million tonnes that human activity currently spews out annually, and you start to see why the IPCC aren't pitching it as any kind of silver bullet for climate salvation. It's also very expensive as the dark red bars indicate on the chart. It adds at least 20% to the cost of any power plant or industrial facility, so commercial enterprises are not exactly rushing to adopt it as best practice. It will be an important technology though for those last few essential but very difficult to decarbonise industries like steel and cement making. But even here, we've already got carbon neutral alternative manufacturing processes that have been developed to production scale and which could be rolled out very quickly if political will existed. If we briefly zoom through the rest of the chart, we can see that there are massive but not cheap opportunities in agriculture, forestry and other land use or AFOLU. Regenerative agriculture and rewilding could sequester billions of tonnes of carbon dioxide every year, starting pretty much immediately, as could reductions in deforestation and increases in reforestation and carefully managed afforestation. And of course all of us especially in rich Western nations, need to reduce our appalling level of food waste and switch to diets that contain far less red meat or even no meat at all. There's a high variability in estimates of the costs here, which is why the bar is grey, but there's no doubt about the benefits in terms of reduced greenhouse gases. In buildings, just being more careful with the way we use energy is a zero cost or in many cases a cost saving measure that could save a billion or so tonnes of CO2 a year globally. Constructing modern energy efficient buildings and fully retrofitting existing buildings will obviously be expensive, but again the reductions in emissions would be very significant indeed. In green transport, all the options except biofuels are achievable at zero extra cost or at a cost saving over the lifetime of a vehicle. 
with a total annual CO2 reduction across the sector of more than 3 billion tonnes. Industry has lots of opportunities and challenges ahead. The benefits of energy and materials efficiency and fuel switching are clear, but they'll all cost money and arguably we'll need to see state incentives in place to encourage these profit-driven enterprises to make the rapid changes required. But the IPCC say, even if we deploy all these options successfully, we'll still need to suck huge quantities of carbon dioxide back out of our atmosphere as well, if we're to stand any chance of keeping warming below 2 degrees Celsius. It's a process known as carbon dioxide removal, or CDR, and the IPCC define it as anthropogenic activities that remove CO2 from the atmosphere and store it durably in geological, terrestrial or ocean reservoirs or in products. There's lots of potential methods for doing this, but some, like reforestation and ocean alkalinization, will take decades to provide their benefits. Direct air capture, or DAX, is being hailed by some as the ultimate solution here, but scaling up from the few thousand tons it captures today to the hundreds of billions of tons it'll need to capture to have any meaningful impact is by no means a given. And it's only going to work if that captured carbon is genuinely sequestered underground like the folks at Climeworks are doing in Icelandic basalt rocks, and not combined with hydrogen to be converted back into hydrocarbon fuels, which is the business plan of the other two existing DAX operators, Carbon Engineering in Canada and Global Thermostat in the United States. So can we really limit global warming to only 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels? Well, the IPCC says it's still technically feasible on paper, but out here in the real world, it's looking extremely unlikely. Does that mean the human race will be extinct by mid-century and our young folk should all be wallowing in a deep black pit of apathy and despair? No, of course not. Like everything else we bumbling humans do, we won't get everything right and we'll probably be playing catch up for the rest of this century. But there is real progress in just about every sector and there's now a huge groundswell of momentum, not just in public opinion, but also in the boardrooms of commercial organisations and financial institutions like banks, pension funds and insurance companies, all of whom now recognise the incontrovertible benefits of robustly addressing the climate emergency and the risks to their future balance sheets and their livelihoods if they ignore the problem any longer. And while all those rich Westerners are transforming their business practices and protecting their bottom lines, the IPCC reminds us that accelerated financial support for developing countries is a critical enabler to enhance mitigation actions and address inequities. Back in 2009, all the rich nations pledged $100 billion a year in climate finance for developing nations. But even now, 13 years later, they still haven't stumped up all the cash. So I guess that'd be a pretty good place to start, wouldn't it? That's it for this week. As always, a massive thank you to our fantastic Patreon supporters who keep these videos ad-free and completely independent and without whom this channel would quite simply not exist. Please do click on the like and subscribe buttons if you found this video useful. Thanks very much for watching. Have a great week if you can. And remember to just have a think. See you next week.